Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, well, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to talk here today, and thank you very much to the organisers for putting on this Sun conference. <clears throat> so I'm Dr. Mark McDonnell from the Australian Institute for Machine Learning at University of Adelaide, and what I'll be talking about is different strategies for using pre-trained models uh, as a practical solution for continual learning. So my talk is divided into three parts. So I'm I'll start by um, <clears throat> describing a categorization of three strategies from the quite recent literature for leveraging strong pre-trained models for continual learning. Uh, in the second part, I'll be going in depth into the third of these strategies and in particular, uh, highlighting our own recent paper in this area. And I'll finish by showing results comparing performance from the three kinds of strategies. Throughout this talk, there are no results for methods involving rehearsal memory, but they will be covering both class incremental learning and domain incremental learning scenarios, which I assume for this audience, I don't need to explain these concepts. Okay, part one. So with the emergence of strong pre-trained transformer networks, there has um, <clears throat> uh, been much interest in continual learning that starts with a very strong foundation model. And most of these works now nowadays use a vision transformer network, typically the B16. Uh, some use ResNet CNNs. And these, these models are uh, usually trained on ImageNet 21K using self-supervised learning, or in some cases then fine-tuned on ImageNet 1K. When starting from this point of having a strong pre-trained network, there is the opportunity for trying strategies for continual learning that won't work for continual learning, which trains models from scratch. <clears throat> um, just uh, one, 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 one point to make is in, in, in this talk, I'll be focusing on classification. And regardless of the strategy, they all require to have a fully connected output head where if there's K total classes after the, the number of tasks to date, then there will be K outputs. So the the the, the work in this area in the last year or so has I I I I, carry, I categorize into three different strategies. So the first strategy is prompting of transformer networks, starting with the learning to prompt work of Zifeng Wang et al, and closely followed up by the same authors with dual prompt. Other papers in this line include S prompts, which applied to domain incremental learning only using a, a multimodal clip transformer networks and coder prompt from Smith et al. The second strategy are those which look to carefully fine tune the network backbone, a strategy which just leads to catastrophic forgetting with non-pre-trained networks, but has been shown to work effectively when done very carefully with a pre-trained model. Um, and by carefully, I mean using sufficiently low learning rates and as shown in the SLCA method by Zhang et al, um, benefiting from having different learning rates in the body compared to the head. One thing in common with these approaches, though, are that they have needed, at least in the papers I've seen, have been, they have needed to combine the fine tuning of the pre trained backbone with a, a specific continual learning method, whether that's learning without forgetting L2 or the classifier alignment method of Zhang et al. The third way in which pre trained models has been used has essentially has been something which I call class prototype or CP accumulation. Um, <clears throat> starting at the bottom here, um, this is our own paper, just accepted for NeurIPS 2023, a method we call RANPAC, strongly influenced by both first session adaptation of Panos et al. and the Adam and Simple Seal methods of Dawei Zhao et al. 
the earlier papers in that list are kind of precursors to those works. Okay, so without without giving away comparative results, um, what what are some of the factors we would consider if trying to decide which strategy would we use? Supposing we wanted to try to use a pre-trained model for practical continual learning, perhaps in an industry setting. Well, this does some factors down the side that we might consider. Um, one, f firstly, one thing in common for all the strategies is that they they don't need a rehearsal buffer, unlike continual learning methods, many continual learning methods trained from scratch. Um, what about the other attributes? Well, looking in the literature, um, in, in my view, I was able to find more ticks for the class prototype methods. Um, they have benefits of being more efficient in terms of how they are trained and the parameters that they use. They're more flexible in being definitely applicable to both transformers and CNNs. Um, <clears throat> but I've got question marks there over, well, which is the best performing because um, kind of the, 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 the best performing methods in each category get, get kind of close to the same performance. I'll come back to this table before the end. Um, so, so given our own paper is a class prototype strategy, I'm going to drill deeply into class prototype methods. So firstly, defining what a class prototype is. If you're familiar with iCal, you should have a pretty good idea of this. Um, and I, I should say everything we're talking about here is image classification. Um, doesn't need to be, but all our examples are. Um, suppose we've got a good feature extractor for a sample, say an image, and we've got a classification task. We can take the training set, and run all samples within a given class through that feature extractor and then compute their average or sum. That gives us a prototype for each class. So an average uh, feature vector for each class. If you can do this in a continual learning setting, you, you get a very simple way to do classification. You can use the nearest class main classifier. Um, all you, all you do in a nearest class mean classifier is take take each prototype, calculate its similarity with a test sample's feature vector, and choose the class of the highest similarity. So a lot like KNN, but much more memory efficient because we only need to keep one feature vector for each class. And as an aside, I'll add much more memory efficient than keeping a rehearsal memory. Okay, so so this is um this is our, our paper. I'll acknowledge my co-authors here: Dong Gong, Armin Parvane, SN Abaznajad, and Anton Vandenhengel. Um, as I said, just accepted for Neurips twenty twenty three, um, and available right now on archive. Um, this is a class prototype based method using pre-trained models. Here's a diagrammatic indication of the algorithm we used. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm not going to start with that slide. I'm going to start with past work and how we've built on it. So here's a depiction of how the um, simple seal nearest class mean method of Zhao at our works. So it's pretty much just the definition of nearest class mean and class prototypes. Zhao et al. took a VIT B16 pre-trained model, kept it frozen, and within each task, extracted the features for each class and kept a memory of those class prototypes, compiled them into um, a, a growing final fully connected layer, which for, for, for ease of implementation. And that's essentially all there is to it. But this is a this this um, in 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 many ways can be thought of as a a, a, a baseline for using pre-trained models. Um, but it gives really good results, actually, um, competitive with prompting methods. But Zhao et al. actually do more than that. They propose a method they call Adam or Adapt and Merge. And they use what's um, been called by Panos et al. first session adaptation of a petal or parameter efficient transfer learning method. So petal methods are a way that's emerged recently to do transfer learning without updating the weights of the pre-trained model. Instead, 
new weights are carefully inserted at various points in a neural network, and only those are updated on the data. So LoRa is an example of that. Zhao et al. use three different such methods for transformer networks. Panos use a different one for convolutional neural networks. In the continual learning context, it makes sense to try to adapt to the downstream data set by training a petal method on only the first task. If those weights are updated on subsequent tasks, then there's a risk of forgetting. But as shown by Zhao et al, you get a significant benefit by adapting on the first session, provided the number of um, samples in that um, first task or session is sufficiently large. Then once they've adapted the pre-trained model in this way, it's just the same as what they did before for simple seal. Okay, so now having described what we're building on, this is what we've added in our own paper, RAMPAC. So firstly, we insert between the output layer of the pre-trained model and the um, uh, use of prototypes, we insert a, a weight layer, a fully connected weight layer that increases dimensionality, uses randomly valued weights that are never trained, they're always frozen, and a nonlinear activation. Secondly, unlike Zhao et al, we ensure that the class prototypes are decorrelated, which is effectively the same thing as doing LDA or streaming LDA. Both of these two factors enables us, as I'll show shortly, to achieve significantly better results than password. To explain a little bit about the first factor, I've got here a figure showing comparisons between not including our random projection layer and various other choices. So the baseline here is the, the blue dots. This is um, data for um, split sci-fi 100 with 10 tasks and the average accuracy after T tasks. We can see firstly that the green trace gets identical performance to not using any random projections. The green trace is to use the random projection matrix, but without a nonlinear activation. And in this case, we project upwards from 784 to 15,000. So it's a very large expansion in dimensionality. If we have a much smaller dimensionality change, we go backwards, the red trace. However, as soon as we ensure we have nonlinear activation, whether that's ReLU or say squaring, we get this increase in performance. Um, that increase in performance does depend on M, the number, the dimensionality, which um, we increase to. Um, you get diminishing returns as M gets too large, but typically you get better results than not doing anything if you increase even 20% from the original dimensionality. So this inclusion of the um, random projection to a higher dimension and nonlinear activation is key to the success of our approach. And it's a method that is very compatible with continual learning because this random weights matrix is never updated. So it's never subject to catastrophic forgetting. Okay, um, there's you know, three frequently asked questions on our work. Um, I don't have time in today to go into those deeper. Um, I'll quickly run through what those questions are as an enticement to read the paper. So uh, firstly, wh why? Why does this nonlinear activation and random projection provide a benefit? Um, so one way we have to try to explain this is um, highlighted in figure 3B and the associated discussion in our paper. The second question is, well, why? Why are decorrelated class prototypes better? Um, that's remembering that that's the second thing we do different to Zhao et al. Um, in the paper, we have a few ways to try to explain that as well. Um, it, it boils down to, instead of using cosine similarity, we have a similarity score, which includes the inverse of the gram matrix of the data. 
And that's not plucked out of thin air. That's actually theoretically motivated, as discussed in our paper, by the connection to least squares regression. Uh, third question is, well, is this decorrelated class prototypes related to streaming LDA um, as used by Panos et al? Well, the answer is yes, uh, very much so. Um, and we we go through the maths of that in the appendix of our paper. Okay, so um, I haven't shown any results yet, so I'll move right into that. Um, so here's a table from our paper, firstly showing compiling some results on a bunch of data sets for the uh, three different prompting strategies. Um, this is how Adam of Zhao et al. compare. Um, it's actually better than the prompting strategies in all but one case. Um, I don't have data for the other data sets for code prompt, um, so it's unclear whether Adam outperforms it on those other data sets. But what is clear is that our own results um, well outperform Adam by the introduction of random projections with nonlinear activation and decorrelated class prototypes. Reducing error rates on these class incremental learning benchmarks by between 24% to 62%. How do we compare to fine tuning methods? So the strongest baseline for that is SLCA. We also outperform that. And we also get very strong results on domain incremental learning data sets. Uh, just to note that this last, um, last line here where there are slightly better results on two data sets does not use the same transformer network. So it's not a fair comparison. So coming back to this table, um, which strategy would be best for practical continual learning? Well, in my view, based on the RAMPAC results, um, that would be my choice. Um, we arguably have a simple method that's applicable to both transformers and CNNs. There are some CNN results in the appendix of the paper. Um, it has theoretical support associated with it, and it's showing um, the best performance across all eight data sets, which we considered in the paper. It does have some limitations. Um, RAMPAC requires more parameters than some prompting methods. Um, well, to be, to be fair, these last two points are probably applicable to all, all methods, all strategies. Um, absolutely essential to start with a strong pre-trained model. And if it's a VIT model, then it's large. Um, and there's questions over whether you could run that at the edge. But I would say as a practical solution, such as for industry applications, that disadvantages are minimal compared to the benefits. Um, if you if you can, if your if your data is in the right domain to benefit from a strong pre-trained model, then um, we've shown that you can get very strong results for continual learning based on that pre-trained model. Um, that said, um, it's it's uh, in my mind all the outline me methods kind of circumvent the general problem of forgetting. They they don't attack it directly and solve it. Um, and that sort of um, makes the use of pre-trained models in the ways outlined here somewhat different to the kinds of problems being attacked in continual learning where you can't start with a pre-trained model. Um, and perhaps it's useful to think of these methods as doing continual transfer learning rather than continual learning directly. And that brings me to the end. Thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions and get involved in discussion. Thanks, Mark. I mean, uh, very interesting. And first and foremost, congratulations on your new tips paper. Uh, great work. Thank you. So, I mean, I had one one question, though. So, uh, when, when you kind of have your uh, random metrics uh, that kind of does the projection, uh, right? I mean, how is it kind of initialized? Is it, is it I mean, is, is there any specific uh, way that you were initializing it, or was it pure random sample from uh, standard normal? I mean, how was it? Um, yeah, look, it, it pretty much works for any distribution. Um, we we used a Gaussian distribution, but it works for um, you know bipolar. So you know you could take a Gaussian random numbers in a um, seven eight four by ten thousand matrix and threshold them to zero one, and that works just as well too. 
Um, and the reason I bring that one up is that 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 enables the weights to be stored more efficiently, if that's a consideration. Um, Got possibly. It. Got that's it. A, Possibly there's a need for the mean to be zero. Um, I, yeah, I, ha I haven't haven't really thoroughly explored the um, uh, that the question. I see. Interesting. So I think there was one question from the audience. So, uh, can you kind of assume uh, that this random projection is doing some kind of an ensembling of networks, and then with with each of this random set of projections coefficient. Uh, and then you have some method to combine these ensemble results. So, I mean, I, I think I mean, the question is more on, can you interpret uh, what, what you were trying to do as ensembling and then combining it later? Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about it from that point of view. Um, I mean, that might give me a, a um, Perhaps, perhaps I don't think I can answer that question directly, but perhaps that gives me an opportunity yeah. to talk a little bit about this this perspective. Um, so, what's shown here is in black what we actually do, mm -hmm. and what show, is shown in red is a comparison where instead of using random projections, we take products of features. So, um, in fact, it's just a subset because um, you know comprehensively taking every product was computationally infeasible. So we took like 10% of them or something. And then we use those for our class prototypes. And you can see that that actually does better than the random projection approach. So Interesting. The, the, the insight I get from this is that um, forming products of features gives more information when doing similarity comparisons than taking... Um, uh, just the raw features or linear combinations of them. Um, so, th and I, to me, that's why it's so important to have the nonlinearity as well as the random projection. Um, because without the nonlinearity, you're not getting some sort of um, cross product term. As soon as you have a nonlinearity, you can have a Taylor expansion in which you get products of features that can then be weighted. So I, I know that doesn't answer the question about ensembling, but yeah, um, yeah, and I, I feel that this is a good for thought uh, maybe uh, later on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So any other questions from uh, any, any other participants? Uh, anyone on the call? Awesome. If not, I think, I mean, thank you very much, Mark. This was, this was a very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. for Actually, yeah, I have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, uh, I'm the Coda prompt okay. author, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wondering your perspective on, uh, do you feel like, you know, do we need to look more at the pre-training part, or do you think there's any way to, like, pre-train methods to directly work better with these types of PEFT huh. uh, continual learning? Well, well, sorry, I how, so. much, I... how much can we keep modifying them in this way without needing to like, you know, add something extra sauce to the mix? Well, I, I hope so, because that's what I'm trying to work on. <laughs> I, I, I can't claim to have strong results yet, but, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to find some ways to, um, do better than just taking an ImageNet pre-trained model and having some other kind of pre-trained model. And and um, well, while I'm talking to you, um, one thing I haven't tried and I'd love to try is seeing what happens if um, I combine what we do with um, with a prompting method. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing and I also found to almost work better than uh, Laura, um, I have almost found Laura type adaptations to work sometimes even better than prompting that could be something to consider uh, yeah i think i saw that in one of the papers i referenced in the fine-tuning list that might be even one of yours was it um we've looked i mean it just seems like all of these like you know there's certain ways to do the same kind of kind of thing um no, I saw you did reference, there was one thing where we found in the workshop paper that if you just did yeah. EWC or L2 regularization on yes. the 
projection matrices and it ended up you know outperforming all of the fancy prompting methods um yeah right that, that, that's this one the closer look paper right yes yeah yeah um so really questions you know for example a coda prompt didn't maybe even need to exist if ewc on just the same parameters outperforms it um, but it seems like your numbers are much higher than that so you great work thank you no thank you yeah, thank you, James. Thank you, Mark. I mean, I feel this is the reason why we are having this on conference. I mean, where like-minded people can come talk, exchange ideas. So great that that's indeed happening. Indeed. Awesome. So yeah, thank you, Mark.